Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Park Chester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel on Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Hi, and welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, um, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. And on this uh, television program today, we talked to Opiemi Parham, uh, MD, a healing artist, integrative medicine consultant, women's reproductive health specialist, and community activist. Welcome to Able Then On Air. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. Okay. So you're a former doctor. I'm still a doctor, still but I'm retired. Doctor. I'm huh? retired. A yeah. retired uh, a doctor, a retired MD. Can you explain a little bit about your former work and what you are doing now as a consultant? Yes. Uh, I'm very happy to be functioning and working out of downtown Montpelier as a retired person living happily on my Social Security benefits. So I have a lot of flexibility on how I charge and whether I do gifting or barter. And I am family medicine trained. That means that I did cradle to grave care. I helped women birth their babies. I <clears throat> helped if I had to, because I was in a rural area with the cesarean sections, if they weren't doing well. I took care of families. I did family counseling. And as you have mentioned, I also did end of life care before it was fashionable or had a special name. They called it they called it deaf doula now. Right. I was a family doctor who took care of my own patients and that meant that when they were dying, I didn't turn them over to anybody else. I took care of them cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. You call yourself a healing artist. Yes, I do. So what is that and um, can you explain more? I would say I have evolved out of what is a conventional doctor mentality and persona. So I evolved away from conventional medicine. I recognize that there's at least four areas where we don't do well. We don't make environments that are sensually pleasant for people to heal in. We don't make... Explain more about that. Well, too. just the smells in a hospital, the sounds in a hospital, how busy everything is, that's not the best place to heal. If you have a psychiatric crisis, you know, we talk about a quiet room, but that's often people restrained with padding on the walls and fluorescent lights still coming down on your head. Okay. Mm. Sensuality. Talk about nursing, nursing history, uh, Florence, when Florence... Nightingale was at the helm. Um, she saw disparities in the healthcare system. Um, you know, doctors weren't sanitizing equipment. 
uh, everything was bloody and nasty, and and things have op uh, things have evolved since then, but. They've evolved and they've devolved, haven't they? Yes, they have. Because we have a gender problem. We have uh, things that were traditionally women's work and things that were traditionally men's work. And when it came to putting them together in healthcare, there's been a struggle here in the United States. And I took the masculine role and played the doctor role, doctor knows best, father knows best, for 22 years. Mm -hmm. But I call myself a healing artist because I am an artist healing into the idea that there's a lot that goes into being well. And it's not just a stethoscope on your chest checking. Arlene, you can start asking questions. Uh, do you believe in alternative medicine? Do I believe in alternative medicine? I have a holistic health certification behind me. So not only did I believe in it, but the last three years that I practiced medicine, I was in an office called the Marino Center for Integrative Health. So I was a family doctor, but the guy next door to me was a Chinese immigrant who was a cardiologist in China and practiced traditional Chinese medicine, including acupuncture. So can you explain, can you define in your own way, or maybe definition, what is alternative medicine? Well, that's a whole question, isn't it? In the United States, politically, I'm going to answer you. Mm -hmm. It's anything that wasn't certified by the big pharma, um, pharma hospital, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical, hospital, industrial complex right now. So chiropractic becomes alternative and not covered if you want to go there. And seeing a naturopath, which is not an allopath, I'm an MD, an ND is a naturopath, becomes alternative. And so does yoga, and so do body massage, and so does herbalism. So anything that really isn't being reimbursed on your health care insurance benefits right now, that's what I would say politically is alternative, which is a shame. And why, yeah. why is it a shame? Because there's so many cheaper ways of caring for ourselves when we get sick mm -hmm. than what we're offered right now by a conventional medical model, even in Vermont, which is pro progressive. Talking about pharmaceuticals, uh, and mental health, let's go there. <clears throat> Do you think pharmaceutical companies are so inclined to, you know, give someone medicine, how can I put this? Um, you know, they diagnose people, but does everybody need a, a conventional pill for medicine, or can they get it alternatively, vice versa? You hit the tender spot in my background because I am <clears throat> very much a mad pride advocate. That means that I see a lot of things that get medicated that really shouldn't be medicated with psychiatric drugs. I also recognize that in 1980, there was a huge flip and psychiatry went in the direction of being technicians who dispense drugs. It was a big enough issue that the American Psychiatric Association head resigned. He was very upset about this particular change. And in my, why, not at why all. Why was he upset? Because it felt like the pharmaceutical industry was making a deal with psychiatric doctors who were feeling like they didn't have time to sit and listen to a long narrative from their patients and spend years trying to help them be better, give them a pill. Mm. Give them a pill to fix it. And then we had a whole story that went with take this pill. And that story was there's a biochemical imbalance of your brain. Sadly, that was not ever proven. I think there's some data right now that they're just trying to collect what serotonin really does, you know, what all these other chemicals or neurotransmitters do, but it was not what we were told back in the 1980s. Go ahead with some more questions. Um. Take your time. Okay. Um, I wish to reduce. I wish to reduce the medicine you sold. Okay. Yeah. Can you can I repeat that? I said I wish they would use different. I wish they would use the medicine instead of giving people, you know, all these medicines for their medical problems. 
Did yeah, there's a there's you, a big problem. Did you with, understand what you meant? Yes, over medication and what we call polypharmacy, where one person has too many drugs, where you you maybe you were feeling depressed and the medicine's not working. So instead of stopping that medicine and starting another one, they keep you on that medicine and they add another one. There's a lot of illnesses mm -hmm. where that happens, where I feel that is not really careful individual care. Do you do think that. people? Um, in terms of mental health, I'm going to say this word. It's called hypochondria. Do you? No. Do you think? No. People are okay. No. So you wanted to say, are we seeing a lot of hypochondriacs that are taking pills they don't need? Yeah. I don't believe that's what's happening. I believe we have a whole new culture of people that are called cultural creatives, and they're not quite in a belief system like a traditional person who believes in God and family and the American way, nor are they modern in their thinking like people who live in cities and, and like cosmopolitan issues and an urban lifestyle. They're a new breed, and that new breed tend to be uh, very spiritual people, not necessarily religious, mm -hmm. uh, also very green uh, in how they think about the planet, how they think about their bodies and food, and most importantly, we feel a lot. We feel a lot of things in mm -hmm. our bodies, and the conventional medical model says, there's nothing wrong with you. So you go to your doctor and you're having headaches all the time, and your doctor does all the tests and says, well, there's nothing wrong with you. Are you still having headaches? Mm -hmm. So I really believe in looking very carefully. How much are you drinking water every day? You can get headaches from dehydration. How much are you eating and do you get hypoglycemic during the day? Are stresses in your sex life, not tonight, I have a headache, you know, causing you to have symptoms? But we often over-medicate the symptoms or won't give people medicine like I'm in pain and I can't get any opioids, right, because it's emotional pain. It's not physical pain. It feels like physical pain, yeah. or it gets relief, it gets relief mm -hmm. from the opioids, like physical pain, so why wouldn't you want more of it, and mm. more of it, and mm. more of it, so. Uh, so would you say that the, um, no, in, uh, so would you say that, um, the pharmaceutical industry, I'm assuming, is a large money-making. First I saw, as I became awake as, a, as an adult mm -hmm. in my 30s, first I saw a lot of my money, my personal tax money, was going into the military, which mm -hmm. I didn't agree with the amount of my tax dollar being spent for war. Yeah. Then I noticed, well, that's also true for the amount of my tax dollar that's being, being spent on big corporate drugs and things. They do the research, but then the development is coming with my tax dollar, like the Moderna vaccine yeah. was developed with my tax dollar. Some of it can be good, but a lot of it feels like, hey, this is another high, high CO2 petroleum producing industry. It's a fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. Medicine, with all that plastic, it's a fossil fuel industry. So we all need to wean ourselves on less of all of that. Mm -hmm. And more alternative type of medicine. Here, take this route. You know, weeds can be healing. You know, I did two years of herbal training after I did conventional medicine to bring some balance back into my work as a healer. And a lot of times you can find things that are helpful in your neighborhood walking around. Mm -hmm because we just lost connection with how much, here, take this root, here, drink this tea, before we got to drugs. Drug, the word comes from dried, from the Dutch, mm -hmm. when the Dutch were hanging their herbs, drugs, to dry, and then pounding them and mashing them and making them more concentrated. Yeah, the coca plant, from cocaine. Coca leaf. Coca leaf is a natural, and then later on it became in natural, you know, it became horrible. And we've done that in many, many, many cases. Valerian is the name of the plant before Valium was a synthesized version of Valerian. Mm -hmm. Valium, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, go ahead with more questions. Yeah, you know, I know that the, all these, uh, you know, all these new and pharmaceutical companies, and they're 
Okay, in terms of the side effects of medication. Yes, side effects. Let's talk side effects. Okay, okay, yeah, let's let, talk side let's effects. Let's talk side effects. Uh, first of all, the book that a doctor will use to look up your side effects is created by the drug companies. The DSO? The, no, the that, PDR. The PDR. Physician's Desk Reference. Okay. What you're talking about is specifically for psychiatric labeling, okay. okay? Yeah. But just generally, if you have high blood pressure or you have diabetes, you look it up in a big book and the, the effects that are listed, and I did not say side, the effects that are listed. If you are a woman and you live in the United States of America, if something happens to your body when you take a drug, pay attention. Yeah. Because they did not test these drugs on women. Mm -hmm. They did not test these drugs on a lot of different people of different colors and different genetic backgrounds. Consequently, we really only know a little bit about what they do with white, healthy men or people in prisons that were used as guinea pigs. And also, back in the 70s in institutions, I'm gonna mention this because we're gonna talk about your activism. Uh, back, in, back in the 70s uh, in the Willowbrook Institution uh, in New York, they used the hepatitis um, they tested hepatitis on people with disabilities. You know, we have such a terrible history. People who are black, people who are disabled, people who were orphans, people who are on the lower end of the socioeconomic status, all of us have been guinea pigs for a lot of drugs. Puerto Rico, the women were guinea pigs for the dose on the oral contraceptive pill. Oops, we got it wrong. We were giving too much estrogen, women were stroking out. They figured that out, then they brought it to the mainland United States. Why is it that, um, that for also people of color and other groups were used as guinea pigs? Is, was there a main reason for that? Well, I'm going to say institutional racism, but I'm going to say we've got institutional racism, we've got institutional sexism, we've got institutional classism. So I am a community activist who believes in health care for all mm -hmm. and does not believe that any places besides Oregon and Vermont have gotten anywhere close, close to the kind of health care that we need. Explain more about your activism and what you do, especially uh, in yeah. people with special needs and so on. Well, because of, of my uh, awareness that medicine was not such a great thing for all patients before I ever went to medical school, I took a year after college when I did a thesis on black women as patients and how white doctors looked at us. And I was like, whoa, this is a whole bunch of craziness. I better take a year and think about whether I really can stomach medical school. Can I go into the belly of the beast and be a doctor? So I was a volunteer in service to America, VISTA, that predates AmeriCorps. Mm -hmm. And my placement was it's a, not the Peace Corps. It's a different no, thing. No, you only do one year. It's very much like the Peace Corps. You would only do one year instead of two. And I was progressive, but not progressive enough to put off medical school for two years. So yeah. I only did one year and stayed in the United States. Yeah. I went to Colorado, and I was placed in the legal center for, and this is an incorrect reference now, handicapped citizens. And it was mainly people who had cognitive impairments, mm -hmm. um, people who had mental health traumas and people who were getting disability benefits and then all of a sudden social security would come in and try to snatch all the money back again. So I did about 120 clients in a year. I was a paralegal who represented for people in that law firm mm -hmm. with uh, administrative law judges for mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. How, um, since, you know, you know, with your advocacy, do you, how have how has Vermont? Let's see if I can. How has Vermont been faring um, in terms of the scorecard, if yeah. you will? How have how has Vermont been faring in the disability community, from housing to medical care? Do you think that Vermont can? Well, obviously people can change, but do you, do you think Vermont has work to do? Oh my goodness, yes. Yes, Vermont has work to do, and sadly, Vermont is ahead of the 50% mark. So if I was gonna give Vermont a grade, I would say Vermont gets a B. It's above average. Mm -hmm. uh, for mental health care, 
Uh, I have seen people do well in a crisis. Unfortunately, I also know that legally, Vermont still has the ability to um, force a commitment with not an end place on it. So you can you could be committed and have to stay for years and years here in Vermont. One step forward, which is you get better services. One step back is that you personally don't have as much control as you would if you were in Massachusetts or okay. if you were in Washington State. I'm going to mention this. Um, and I mentioned New, New York a lot because they, you know... Because that's where you're from. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Mayor Eric Adams of New York said uh, with, within the last week that if you're mentally ill and in the train stations or homeless and stuff, they, they will force you to go into a psychiatric facility to get treatment. Do you think... In terms of your scorecard, do you think people should be forced to get treatment if they're mentally challenged? Or I know they have rights. Oh I my know goodness! People have rights. Yeah, what you're talking about is very complicated. I'm still going to say above average for Vermont relative to other states. I think it's less likely you're going to get shot dead in Vermont if you call 911 with a mental health emergency in your family. Okay, that's really brutal to say it, but that's what we have to really think about. Why is They're, that? Why is that? Because the police have had better training mm -hmm. here than they've had other places. They have where Team I've been. Two here, yeah. In Thank Vermont. you. I I have a adult offspring with mental health challenges, and I was so grateful one time when I called nine one one that a social worker arrived with the police to help get them the next step, which was from out of my car to a hospital for treatment. No, I don't think treatment should be forced, but I think there are all kinds of three-day holds that get used. And again, that's what I'm saying about Vermont. Vermont does not have the happy after three days you go to court and you, can, you have to be reassessed. Vermont can still hold people too long, mm -hmm. in, my, in my opinion. Uh, go ahead with more questions. Um, Take um, your time. Has the health care really improved in Vermont, yes or no? You know, this is really interesting, yes and no, okay? Yes, it has improved in that I came to Vermont and could use a naturopath as my primary care physician and have it paid for under my uh, Medicaid, it would have been, or my a little bit higher Vermont medical health plan. However, those medical health plans are getting worse. So the medical health plans themselves are more corporate and more um, twist your arm behind your back and make you pay premiums and not get any benefits than they were 10 years ago. In my personal anecdotal opinion, I haven't done any studies, but I personally am eligible now for Medicare and this, the Part D, once you get to be 65, means I have to have drug coverage. I don't take any prescription drugs. I have to pay every month to have coverage. And I'm negotiating right now because somehow or another, it looks like they lost the last six months of my Medicaid care Part D coverage, and I'll owe the government money. So I am fighting that kind of thing because that's just silly. And a lot of people find themselves ground in circles, trying to track the bureaucracy. So do you think Obama's, the Obamacare? It didn't go far enough. It didn't go far enough. It did not go far enough. Bernie Sanders was all over health care is a human right. And then when we put together the legislation that would have worked, we could not get it funded. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Yeah, and especially when those, <clears throat> when a lot of people don't have, there are some people in this country that still don't have health care. There's many people who don't have them, health care. And in the disabled community, I can't tell you how many people I saw just start to get on their feet. Like maybe they got money to go to school and they would lose their personal care attendant because they were considered doing something called substantial gainful activity. There's nothing wrong with a person with a special need working. Not at all. The problem is that people get penalized for going back to work. They get penalized for trying to move forward. It's okay if you are needing your benefits 
while you're also trying to improve your life? Why snatch the benefits away and leave the person sliding back down? Mm -hmm. yeah, um, so now in terms of the way people with special needs are treated, that's a whole entire different show, but <laughs> it can be. But, yeah. but words, okay, yeah. and how they have changed from the word retarded to handicap to disabled. You forgot crippled, crippled. along the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. Like uh, the N word to colored to Negro to African American descendant of slaves. Language matters from he pronouns to she pronouns to Z, 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 I program. And they, they even matter. had a horrible. Um, I'm going to say it, you can tell me, way back when, when you talk about things like the N-word and the NAACP and all of that, they had a horrible, they used to call people Uncle Tom and other derogatory words. And they've also, you know, crippled uh, uh, um, and you know, disabled. So how have, in your opinion, scorecard with that, uh, do you think we still need to change? Uh, well, addressing people as people yeah. and human, but. Yeah, addressing people as people and asking people what they want to be called and how they want to be addressed and not making assumptions. And, uh, you know, we were talking about how I got involved with all of this. Curb cuts were the first thing that I noticed us being crazy about, curb cuts, the idea of a person in a wheelchair being able to get up on a cement path. I just was back in the day so appalled as the Americans with Disabilities Act went through at the resistance that was being offered. It's like, haven't you ever imagined that you're going to be with a baby stroller and want to get up or down? Or maybe you're going to be in a wheelchair for a week or two temporarily. How can you be opposing this? So I recognize that it is big business. I'm sad, but it's people who do not want to share the wealth are hanging on to too much of the wealth. And Vermont is doing better than average, but we still have too many people hanging on to too much of the wealth, even here in Vermont. What do you mean by hanging on to too much of the wealth? Well, um, looking at our medical, because that's what I'm, I'm talking about, that we could be much more generous at the Medicaid level, at the state level, in the kind of benefits that people get. And I want us to continue to go forward and model for the nation. OK, let's talk about housing and the problems there. There we start with the elevators and the ramps and the call buttons and the how do you connect to 911 if you're a person with any kind of special needs. That's where we start. And then we go immediately, as I, a community activist, would say, we need to know that it takes a village not just to raise a child, but to care for every member of the village. It takes a village. I want a nut house in every neighborhood. I want, I, that want means a, a nut house. Let's really get politically offensive. The idea of what we used to call the places where we institutionalized people who were having psychiatric crisis. I want a nice little three bedroom house that is staffed by people who have experience with mental health crises, have had personal mental health crises, or have children or relatives with mental health crises. I want us to take turns, and that's the place you go for a week's rest, or three days or, or rest. Or respite, they call it. They call it respite, and it's too short, too much of the time. And uh, re people who are in crisis need the respite. The people who are the caregivers need a respite from the people they care for. Now, there's an old, an old acronym, or is still used, not in my backyard. You got that right. OK. Yes. So talking about some other states, community boards or boards would say, OK, you can't have this group home, or you can't have this facility here, because people with disabilities or people with special needs will cause problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Your take on that? Well, I worked, Why? Yeah, yeah, I worked for eight years in Western Massachusetts in 
a three bedroom psychiatric alternative and nobody wanted it in the neighborhood. You're absolutely right. And then people realized, huh, we wouldn't even know it was here most of the time. I think over the eight years I worked there, there may have been two times where we needed to have help with either an ambulance or the police coming. But that's true in almost any neighborhood you're going to be. If you look at 10 years of living in community, somebody's going to have a heart attack and be taken away in the ambulance, right? So again, sharing the wealth also means sharing the responsibility when we have crisis. So I really am a firm believer in smaller is better, uh, dis, dis, dispersing people into group homes rather than a big institution or, or a state hospital has worked better here in Vermont do you specifically. S- do you also think that, um, I, I, I hate using this term, but sweeping things under the rug or sweeping situations under the rug, you know, or looking the other way. Do you? Do we you have think? a culture yeah. mm-hmm. that does that. United and why States is that? culture, because we are just coming to terms with how poorly we are parenting, how much stress there is if you're a nuclear family or less. You know, Explain with, what a nuclear family is. That would be two parents with 2.5 kids. The, the 0.5 is usually described as a dog or a pet. You know, you got one boy, one girl, and it's the perfect little family, except you always need, in my, in my story, you always need one more adult than child, wherever you are, so that somebody can lock themselves in the bathroom and cry for half an hour. Because mm-hmm. you know, child rearing is hard, and uh, that it takes a village to raise a child. It especially takes a village when they get to be teenagers. They don't need less care, they need more. It takes a village to get them between the ages of 18 and 25, when a lot of people um, have psychiatric crisis. And why are they having psychiatric crisis? Because we don't know what else to call this. Mm. Maybe it's a spiritual emerge and see. Maybe it's a spiritual emergency. I don't know what it is, but things are happening to our youth between the ages of 18 and 25, and we need to pay attention. Um, <clears throat> for a brief minute, let's talk well more. Um, the opiate crisis, uh, the, um, you know, the suicidal drugs that people use, your take on that, and how has the media um, been doing a job or scorecard with the mental health community? Oh, goodness. So remember I said four things conventional medicine doesn't do well. We don't put people in healing spaces. We also don't let them talk about their sex lives for good, bad, and the ugly of it. A lot of us have been abused as children. We also don't talk about spirituality, meaning when you're in crisis, what do you lean on? What is it that gets you through? Who is it that gets you through? And that last one is suicidality and homicidality. We get so angry, so frustrated that we act out in ways that aren't good for us or other people. Like suicide is the, is the worst snap judgment decision anyone can make. Arlie? Oh, you lost her. Arlie? Hold on, I gotta get her back. Hold that thought. Oop, hold, wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Hello? Sorry about that. Uh, Okay, I'm going to backtrack off that question. Um, How has the media been treating uh, people with mental health or physical challenges when it comes to... um, you know, things like suicide and other situations like that. I really have to search to find good quality media in these areas. I'm very disappointed in sort of like how low we've gone. Uh, In both the soap operas we do and the dramas we share and how real crime is more interesting if you're a voyeurist and looking at this stuff than helping your neighbor who might need something next door. You're busy watching a show about somebody who's having 
trauma in their life rather than helping or listening to your neighbor or your friend who might have the same level of trauma. So I don't find the media terribly helpful. I do know that you can be discerning and you can find your way through to good things. There is an Australian channel, and I can't remember the name at the moment, but it does lots of really positive videos on differently able people of all kinds, little people. I watched one, somebody who's got a locked in syndrome, uh, somebody who has no limbs because they had sepsis when they were a baby and they had gangrene of all four. No, not, not sob stories, not voyeuristic, but really inspirational stories. I think it's called, I'll, I'll send it to you so you can you know, put a little note on the screen, but uh, I have had to work to find that. And once you find those things, then you can raise children with positive attitudes. Mm -hmm. you, they see, an example, an example from last night, Disney Plus has a nutcracker that is all about uh, hip hop. Okay. Yeah. I was it's a hip -hop, hip hop Christmas story the kind of thing. Hip hop Nutcracker on Disney Plus. I was surprised and delighted to see that a featured dancer has a missing left leg. Okay. He was he was the king of the rats or the mice, mm -hmm. and he did this amazing hip hop routine, and he's working with less than you or I have, and it looked wonderful, and it was exciting, and it wasn't even like, ooh, what's going on there? It was just exciting. So. Um, any more questions? Uh, no. Okay. Um, what are your future goals as an activist, healing artist, and what you do? And then the last question to that, um, how can we improve as a society when helping um, those less fortunate and those that are Differently able. Heard and appreciated. And one of the reasons I call myself a healing artist and an artist healing is because I'm moving into different areas of how I can help. So I'm not going anywhere. I retired to Vermont. I am a Vermonter by choice. Mm -hmm. That means you'll see me around town a lot. That means when you see me, if we ever get over this COVID situation where we have to wear a mask, I want a hug. Give me a hug. Offer a hug. The biggest, the biggest tool on the planet that's used when people are sick is sound. We pray over people. We shake rattles over people. We sing to people when they're ill, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to start where people are and say we also have two ears and one mouth, so we should be listening to each other's stories. The more we listen to each other's stories, like now, like here, the better we can be at empathizing with each other's crises and problems. Uh, your take on what is the definition? I know there are definitions. What's, so people can understand. This is kind of the last question. What is the difference between empathy and sympathy? Good question. Um, empathy is when you really are feeling you're walking in the other person's shoes, all right? Yeah. And sympathy is when you're watching that person over there walk in their too tight shoes that are hurting their feet, and you go, oh, that's so sad, okay? Mm -hmm. Empathy is when you can feel yourself walking in their shoes. Sympathy is when you're watching them over there and saying, oh, and you're having pity for them. Empathy is no. difficult. Yeah. Because we don't empathy, want to have pity for people. We want to we help want, them. We want to, but in order to help them, it helps to feel what they're feeling. And we don't like feeling bad feelings in this culture. Back to the opioid crisis. We do not like pain. Not physical pain, not emotional pain, not spiritual pain. We don't like looking at painful things except when we're voyeuristic and we're doing it for other reasons, right? We, we, we can get better at this. Mm -hmm. And my song is, All We Need Is Love. It sounds like a platitude, but it's true. If we really did connect with other people, I do believe we would do a better job with all layers of our so social strata. would you say that all of the globe has kind of lost connection with people? Absolutely. And COVID showed us more than anything else if we could not even share the wealth 
of a coveted vaccine with the whole world, how do we ever expect to have universal health care here in Vermont? If we can't have universal health care in Vermont or Oregon, I'm sorry, the two whitest states in the country, you think we're going to get Vermont it in New York? Vermont is the whitest state? One of the top three, as is Oregon. Right. Okay. And those are the places right now that have the best chance of getting universal health care. Well, the correct word is Caucasian. Caucasian. State. Caucasian. State. European descent settlers who arrived here and took over the lands of the unseated Abenaki. Yeah. Those people. Yes. Yep. Well, yeah. um, with that said, uh, with that said. We, we thank you. Uh, for I joining am so us. happy to have been here, and you'll We're, see me around town. And you'll come town. back. Uh, and you'll see me around town, and I like to sing, and I'm really excited about the young people and making them enthusiastic and not making them feel like we've totally squandered their future. Mm. So thank you for having um, we me. We would like to thank you for joining us on this edition. Yeah, and I would like a, to come back. Uh, of Able to Um So for more information on, on um, Opayemi's work, you can go to her website, at www.opeyemiparham.com. You got That's it. That's opeyemiparham.com. And also, if, uh, for those that want to find out more about um, what you've seen on this program today and other programs of Ableton on Air, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. That's O-R-C-A-M-E-D-I-A dot -E net. I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm Thank you to our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health and Green Mountain Support Services and many others. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time on the next exciting edition of Ableton On Air. See you next time. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, Empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Able Then On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition. Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Den On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England Chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.